If you made a list of the world's great food cultures, among all the deserving places, there's no question that somewhere in your top 10, you'd probably have Thailand and Japan. From Thai curries and Bangkok classics to regional specialties and the treasures of Isan, Thai food is almost unsurpassed. And then there's Japan, with its renowned sushi counters and beloved dishes, ancient traditions and master chefs. Anyway, put those two cuisines together and imagine the magic. Maybe there's a soup mixing dashi with tom yum seasoning, Thai crispy pork in tempura batter, or a pancake wrapped around a hot dog. Because yeah, that's what actually happened. Let me introduce you to Kanom Tokyo, the fusion dish that nobody asked for. It's the favorite snack of elementary schoolers across Thailand and something that doesn't look Thai or Japanese, but somehow it's both. Today on OTR, we're trying to figure out what happened, how this came to be, who made it first and who makes it best, and come to think of it, why is Bangkok so Japanese anyway? All right, usually on OTR, I spend the first few minutes of a video talking about how great the dish is that we're covering. I mean, that's why we cover it. But I'm going to be honest, when the subject of our video is a hot dog wrapped in a pancake, well, this one might be a struggle. It's not my favorite thing. In fact, in one of the greatest food cities on the planet, I cannot in good conscience tell you that you have to fly here to try this. It's fine. It's, it's, it's fine. You'll see Kanam Tokyo everywhere in Bangkok, but unless you're from here and consider it a fun treat, you probably walk right past it because when you're surrounded by so much other great stuff, well, why would you waste your valuable space on this? It's exactly what it looks like it's going to be. A pancake made from a batter of wheat flour with egg, milk, sugar, and baking powder spooned onto a flat top and filled with stuff. The classic has a hot dog, sometimes with egg and some ketchup or maggi sauce. And then there are the sweeter versions made with things like kaya or pandan custard. If I was giving you a food tour of this city and we stopped for Kanam Tokyo, assume you've made me angry or that something has gone terribly wrong. So the natural question then is, why are we telling this story? Well, it's mostly about the name, Kanam Tokyo. Now, I've been to Japan, I love Japan, I love the food in Japan, and I did wonder what this did to deserve that connotation, or what they did to get stuck with this label. So I started going down that rabbit hole, and as it turns out, well, this, this is actually one of the most fascinating stories of any dish we've ever covered. It's not just about the name at all. This is something that goes way, way back and deserves to be recorded. So this morning, I'm going to put my bias aside and take a trip to Bangkok's Satorn District, where we'll start our journey by visiting the place known for serving the city's very best, Kanam Tokyo. I guess if my cold, hard heart is going to open to Kanam Tokyo, it would be here, along San Luis Soy 3. I might not trust the dish, but I do trust Thai locals, and this place for 10 years has seen lines form almost from sunrise to claim a few of their famous rolled up treasures. Uh, so we have a custard one, which is a classic sweet one. We have one that's like a deep fried piece of chicken and another one that is some kind of like a bolognese, like a pork ragu. And that one is what I'm going to start with first. The pancakes are crispy. <laughs> All right, that's actually really good. I'm willing to accept that I was too quick to disparage Kanam Tokyo. Actually, the version here was really good. But still, if this is a dish called pancake rolls, we probably wouldn't be doing this video. 
So before we get to our next location, let me talk about the name. Now, it's pretty well understood that this is a Thai dish, not Japanese. And the idea of giving a dish a foreign name simply because of branding might sound strange on the surface, but it's actually something with a ton of precedent. We covered that topic once before on OTR in our video about American fried rice, which is also a famous Thai dish and is, as you can probably guess, not American at all. It was created in Bangkok in the 1950s. And that's not the only example of a Thai dish named after some far-flung country. Like a lot of markets that sell Kanam Tokyo also have a sweet snack called Lod Chong Singapore, which is not Thai or Singaporean, it's Indonesian, and got its Thai name from an old restaurant in Bangkok's Chinatown called Singapore Pochana. This kind of thing happens a lot more than you might imagine. By now, pretty much everyone knows that French fries aren't actually French, they're Belgian, but even that might be misleading as they probably came from Spain. French toast isn't French either, in fact its recipe goes all the way back to the 5th century in ancient Rome, before catching on during the Middle Ages in England. The French might have gotten unfair credit for fried potatoes and egg toast, but these things work both ways, like with chicken Kiev named for the Ukrainian capital, but you guessed it, actually French. If you'll indulge me for a moment, I want to keep going because this stuff can be pretty fascinating. Raise your hand if you assumed German chocolate cake was German. No, it's from Texas and was first made using chocolate from a man named Samuel German. And Dutch baby isn't Dutch, it's from Seattle, named in honor of America's so-called Pennsylvania Dutch. The Americans love giving foreign names to local foods, not least of which a trio of famous sauces, like French dressing, which first shows up in 1900 in the US Ladies Home Journal, Italian dressing, which was invented at Ken's Steakhouse in Massachusetts in the 1940s, and Russian dressing, which got its name because it used to include caviar, even though it was first made in Nashua, New Hampshire. What about Crab Rangoon, named for Yangon in Myanmar, and yes, also American, a creation of the legendary Trader Vicks? And then there are the famously American California rolls, which are actually Canadian. Nothing is what it seems. Danish pastries come from Austria. Lumpia Shanghai are Fujianese Filipino. Kiwi fruits are from China. Mongolian barbecue is Taiwanese, nasi goreng pattaya is Malaysian, and Manchurian chicken, well that was invented in Mumbai in 1975. Also from India is a dish called Nargisi kofta, adapted into the very much not Scottish Scotch eggs, and the Scots also have nothing to do with Scotch bonnet peppers, which the Jamaicans named after the allegedly similar looking Tam O'Shanter cap. So the question is, is Kanam Tokyo an act of genius branding? Yes, but that's only a small part of the story. And we'll get back to it after our next stop at another Kanam Tokyo legend, just a few blocks away from San Luis Soy 3. ตอนตอนเด็กอะค่ะก็คือชอบกินขนมโตเกียวก็คือเลิกเรียนอะไรอย่างเงี้ยค่ะก็จะชอบไปกินขนมตามข้างทางหลังเลิกเรียนอย่างเงี้ยค่ะก็เลยพอเห็นเขาเปิดร้านก็เลยมาสมัครงาน I'd have been happy just to get on with the history of the dish but I guess it's important to show that Kanam Tokyo is not just a hot dog in a pancake there are places that have taken that simple construct and turned it into something from Willy Wonka, an entire meal in a very small package. Perm kuma like young and shen tasamut na long lian ying, it's a big hair, say cream, lua, jabin, say hai, say gomus up the wa, hang la, low hat, jami, say yo, ma, and a half a man, yes, if you say, soon signature, he did a hard jami, been say, someone cream sheet of four, hai kim lawa, lua, ah, hasat cream, lago, eton in Japan.
Sorry, with a classic, I taste. It feels weird to, to do this in like an artisan way. I'm like I have notes of a hot dog. Uh, we have notes of ground pork. Let's try it with whatever this sauce is, which is ketchup. So, all right, eating fancy Kanam Tokyo at Tokyo Roaster in the heart of Bangkok, we can get a sense of how effective the branding of this dish has actually been. But as for when and why it got its name, well, for that, we need to go back in time 60 years and start this story at the beginning. It's 1964. The Gemini 1 has just sent back the first clear photos of the surface of the moon. Nelson Mandela is sentenced to life in prison and a young boxer named Cassius Clay becomes the heavyweight champion of the world. Here in Bangkok, the city is developing fast. What was long perceived as a global backwater cut from the Southeast Asian jungle is modernizing, with support from Thailand's new American allies and an endless workforce arriving from Isan. And as Bangkok grows, well, so too does the culture of foreign food, with imported ingredients not just available, but exciting and trendy. On December 10th, at the junction of Racha Damri and Rama I, the so-called Racha Prasong intersection, a building would open that would represent a giant leap in Bangkok's development, a benchmark that would push the city forward, and to that point, one of the most exciting things to happen in the city's modern history. I'm talking about the arrival of the Japanese superstore, Daimaru. And in 1964, Daimaru represented more than just a department store, it was the future. Just 19 years earlier, Japan had been on its knees, humbled and defeated at home and across the Pacific theater. And in less than a generation, they'd rebuilt into a booming economy, growing through manufacturing and technology, expanding at a pace the world had never seen. It was a time and place today referred to as the economic miracle. With Japan's growing financial clout came the introduction of their brands into overseas markets. Products like Toyota, which entered the US in 1958, Nintendo, which partnered with Disney in 1959, and Sony, which saw the sales of its portable radio grow to 5 million units by the late 1960s. And for a time, bigger than all of them was Daimaru. The brand got its start all the way back in 1717 in Kyoto, growing into a small chain of dry goods outlets, incorporating in 1907 and during the post-war recovery, scaling up and up and up. You could find anything in Daimaru, import quality but at a fraction of the European prices. The mall would be fun, exciting, and packed with activities and good food. By the 1960s, it was the largest retailer in all of Japan and had expanded to Malaysia and Hong Kong. The Bangkok location was Daimaru's third overseas expansion, and when the mall opened, thousands crowded the Racha Prasong intersection to visit the first store in the city to have air conditioning and to ride the first escalator ever installed in the country of Thailand. With the initial success of Daimaru, a secondary economy developed outside the entrance, with a street market hawking snacks and trinkets to the hordes of well-to-do shoppers coming and going. And one of those snacks, well, you can probably guess what that was. All right, so we are at the Racha Prasong intersection. And if you can tell from context where I am, uh, the Apple store is just right there, uh, Central World Shopping Center, Gay Sorn Village, you walk back that way, you're at uh, the electronics markets and textile stuff in Pratunam. Uh, but it was here, uh, the intersection that's called uh, Racha Prasong, that in 1964 is where the Thai Daimaru department store uh, was. And so this was like, you know, long before it was the center of Bangkok's shopping, it was kind of a different center of Bangkok's shopping. Uh, and that's where the story of Kanam Tokyo begins. This is Ground Zero, the site of the old Thai Daimaru and the well from which all future Kanam Tokyo would spring forth. There's no plaque on the pavement, but it was here. 
And in the context of 1960s Bangkok, the incredible spread of the snack does make sense. I mean, you gotta remember, back then anything foreign was so new that who cares if it was something that was actually like Japanese or American or Singaporean. This was different stuff and the name just added to the mystique. And what could be more exciting than a snack using foreign ingredients and techniques and branded in a way that triggered thoughts of the monumental new shopping center which helped bring this city into the future? The Kanon Tokyo cart outside the old Tai Daimaru would become almost as well known as the store itself, and by now it's certainly better remembered. The glory days of the store wouldn't last for long. It was absorbed into a bigger shopping center in 1972, relocated in 1994, and gone for good four years later. But Kanom Tokyo would only keep growing. From the very beginning, it would catch on with Thailand's young generation and quickly spread across the country. The legacy of a unique moment in Thai history. So that explains where and when Kanam Tokyo was first sold in Bangkok and why the name, the timing, and the snack itself combined to help it catch on in cities far and wide. But there are still a couple parts missing. First, of all the things that a vendor might have chosen to make, why this? Why specifically make this combination? And second, if the whole point was foreign branding, why not call this Kanom USA? Like, it's objectively way more American than Japanese, and as we already mentioned, by 1964, Thailand and the US were close partners. Well, as it turns out, we've only scratched the surface of this wild story. See, while the street market was thriving outside the shopping center, inside there were food vendors too selling Japanese snacks that Thailand had never seen before. And one of them, well, that brings us to the next part of this story. There's a story about the creation of Dorayaki that goes back almost a thousand years to the 12th century AD. According to legend, a warrior monk named Saito Musashibo Benkei was hiding from enemies in the house of a farmer. When he left under cover of darkness, he forgot to carry his gong, which the farmer didn't recognize, so he used it as a cooking pan, on which he'd make a cake forever to be known as Dorayaki. Now, that's not the only origin story. There's also one where the farmer made a cake in the shape of a gong to present to Benkei, and another where it's not the farmer, but an elderly couple who served him the pancakes to heal him when he was badly injured. Now, it's not likely that Doriaki is actually that old, but it has been around long enough for those myths to sound at least possible. In reality, it's almost certain that the first dorayaki was made somewhere around the end of the 1500s, using a technique brought by the Portuguese when the two naval powers became close partners in trade. Dorayaki, according to that theory, was adapted from the Portuguese Castea, a cake with a spongy texture not that different from today's Kanam Tokyo. We know Dorayaki was written about as far back as the 17th century during Japan's Edo period, and the oldest bakery still open today serving the dish in Tokyo has been open for 163 years. In 1914, a Dorayaki shop in Ueno began selling the dish with azuki bean and red bean paste stuffed between two pancakes, and that would quickly become the new standard version, taking such a place of honor in Japanese society that when a man is introduced to his fiancé's family, he's supposed to bring with him dorayaki to represent a strong and auspicious union. Now, as a side note, that 1914 version was actually the first recorded time that dorayaki was made with two pancakes as a sandwich. Before that, it was a single pancake wrapped around a filling. In other words, intentional or not, the Thai Kanam Tokyo is actually closer to the original dorayaki than is most dorayaki. Anyway, for the next stop on my stuffed pancake crawl, we need to try some authentic dorayaki. If you live in Bangkok, you probably know this place. It's called Custard Nakamura, and it's the Walmart of Japanese bakeries, a shop hidden deep in an alley around the corner from M. Quartier that's so popular that if there's ever a flower shortage in this city, it's probably their fault. 
They sell everything you'd find in a cheap bakery in Tokyo. Sandwiches and cutlets and all kinds of desserts. And in the corner, just opposite the checkout counter, there's the shelf of dorayaki. All right, let's give this a try. It's exactly what it says it's going to be. It's a pancake with red bean in the middle. Red bean is such a cruel joke. I've come to like it. But I remember moving to China, and you think you see something with a nice chocolate film filling, and you take a bite out of it, and it's red bean. And this is just like the, the bane of the existence of every first time uh, arrival to Asia. That's good. It's a, it's a pancake with red bean. Finishes later, let's keep walking. Uh, yeah, this is this brings back memories like my first trip to Bangkok as a backpacker. And I was like Mr. Backpacker, like elephant pants, all this stuff, and like I uh, I read on, I don't know, Lonely Planet or Wiki Travel or something that like there were a lot of these kind of cool Japanese streets in Bangkok. And at that time, uh, I don't remember if I'd been to Japan yet, but I really wanted to kind of have that experience. So I just like walked down an alley and found something that said like Japanese social club or had just had letters in Japanese. And I walked in and everyone just it was like a scene from a movie where everybody just puts out their cigarettes all at once. Server comes up to me. She says, uh, what are you doing here? I said, Sushi? And she says, I don't think you belong here, sir. You need to leave. And uh, yeah, these are some really old school neighborhoods. I don't think that in Tonglor, where we are right now, uh, you would have that experience, uh, at least not in 2024. But uh, yeah, it's a really fascinating sort of subculture part of Bangkok for sure. So the broad strokes of the birth of Kanam Tokyo are that in 1964, a Japanese snack called dorayaki was introduced to Thailand at the Daimaru Shopping Center. And then the dish was adapted by vendors set up just outside. And that is the story. But all you have to do is take a walk around the heart of Bangkok to see that there's more than just that shopping mall that connects the land of smiles to the land of the rising sun. And as a matter of fact, the story of Kanam Tokyo and its connection to Dorayaki, well, it goes a lot deeper than meets the eye. So while we've already talked about the Edo period in Japan, let's pick this up about 400 years ago here in Siam. This time we start in Ayutthaya around the year 1600. Japanese merchants and mercenary soldiers have established a presence in the Siamese capital, like the Portuguese building a small settlement in a corner of the city. That corner would swell by the thousands in the year 1614, however, when the shogun Takugawa Ieyasu outlawed Christianity in Japan and countless Japanese Christians fled. One of those Christians was a man named Yamada Nagamasa, who'd actually come in 1612 and would rise in power to become the Thai governor of Nakhon Si Tamarat. There was also a woman named Ursula Yamada, known to history as the mother of the mother of Thai desserts. Her daughter was Maria Guillomar de Pina, who is credited for introducing Portuguese techniques to Siamese kitchens, considered the first here to make things like kaya jam, foy tong, and dozens of other sweet snacks. And I'm not saying that dorayaki might have started in Siam before going to Japan. There's no evidence at all that that's the case. But I bring it up because it's fascinating to think that the Portuguese brought the technique of making cakes to both Japan and Siam around the same time, and both would make their own desserts from that inspiration, with the ties led by a half-Japanese woman creating things like this, and the Japanese turning it into dorayaki, which would eventually find its way back to Thailand and then be reinvented again. Anyway... 
By the end of the 17th century, both Japan and Siam would enter a long period of isolation, cutting off ties with the outside world, including with each other. In 1855, Thailand would begin reopening, and Japan would follow 13 years later. And in 1887, King Rama V and Emperor Meiji would sign a declaration of amity and commerce, resuming the close ties between the two nations. Now, the years between 1887 and when the Thai Daimaru store opened weren't all love and happiness. There were high notes, like when the Japanese sent master silk makers to teach Thai students. That's now grown into a place known today as Kasetsart University. But the first half of the 20th century is probably most notable for the time Japan actually invaded Thailand, less than 24 hours after the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941. It's a really weird footnote in history as it led to a war that would last exactly five hours, at the end of which Siam and Prime Minister Pibun Songkram agreed to form an alliance with the Japanese, officially joining the Axis powers of World War II, and Thailand declared war on England and the United States. Now, this part is realistically not related to the story of hot dog pancakes, but if I don't get it in now, I have no idea when I can work it into a video. As the story goes, the directive was issued by Pibun's government for his ambassadors to deliver their war declaration to those enemy countries. However, his emissary to the U.S., Seni Pramaj, defied the order and instead organized an underground resistance against the Japanese called the Free Thai Movement. Now, at the same time, the Axis Alliance was viewed positively at home as Pibun planned to use the opportunity to reclaim ancient Siamese territory that was now part of Myanmar. But the domestic opposition grew as well, with Free Thai gaining support from members of the military, government officials, and even royalty, including Queen Rampai Bani, the guardian, if you remember, of Chef McDang, as a very random side note. In 1944, the alliance would collapse and Pibun would be thrown from power. And after the war was over, because of the work of the Free Thai movement, the United States did not view Thailand as an enemy and in fact invested heavily in the country's reconstruction and development. That included re-establishing business ties with Japan, which was now under U.S. administration. And by the time the dust had settled, both countries were on the rise and their relationship would prove critical as they moved into the second half of the 20th century. In 1962, a Japanese business formed the Thai-Japanese Joint Venture Company, which would become a leader in Thailand's infrastructure development, building roads and highways around the capital. The auto industry would follow, then electronics, with Japanese factories on Thai soil bringing financial growth to both economies. It also brought people. While the reputation of Thailand abroad has been as a haven for Western tourists, the truth is, as recently as the 1990s, more than half of all foreigners in Thailand were Japanese. Today, if you don't count refugees and migrant workers, the number is still as high as one in four, with almost 40% of all foreign investment in the country still coming from Japan. There are more late-night establishments in Thailand servicing Japanese businessmen than any other group. And when it comes to restaurants, at the last count, there were 4,094 that served Japanese food in Thailand, with more than half of that number in Bangkok, and the vast majority concentrated here, along Sukhumvit between Tonglor and Prompong. Honestly, one of my absolute favorite things about living in the city is the uh, enormous amount of izakayas that are not just Japanese, but are specific to different cities or regions or islands in Japan. Uh, we filmed at one once in our American Fried Rice video at the uh, Okinawa place, which might still be my favorite in the whole city. There's two Hokkaido restaurants around here. Uh, there's a number that come from different cities in Honshu, if you wanted to try real Japanese food, and that can be anything from high-end sushi all the way to, you know, a uh, karaage and a beer, you know, at a late 90s Akaya, uh, best cities in the world for it outside of Japan 
would be Bangkok and Taipei, if I had to say, at least from my experience, and nothing else really comes close. It is absolutely one of the best things about living in Bangkok is the ability to, wherever you are, especially along Sukhumvit, to just say, you know what, it's a hot day outside, I want a beer, maybe a couple pieces of uh, <laughs> karaage, and uh, yeah, it's it's quintessential Bangkok experience, even though it is very much not Thai, it's just Japanese. It doesn't have much to do with our story, but At some point, I did need to have something in my system that is not a pancake. During the day on Sukhumvit 26, a line forms that stretches down the street outside one of the country's most famous noodle shops. To serve as the crowds, vendors sell Thai snacks, including more often than not, Kanam Tokyo. But after 5 p.m. when the shop closes, the street vendors and tourists go home and the alley changes into something completely different, a cluster of old-school Japanese restaurants. And while in the daytime Thailand's busy streets might see their own version of a pancake wrapped around some fillings, in the evening, businessmen from Japan come here for dinner, whiskey, and of course, dorayaki, the treat that started it all. This is a place called Jidori Cuisine Ken. It's a Michelin-rated izakaya, a place with its own chicken farm that every evening sells some of the best skewers in Bangkok. Coming here, or to so many of the great Japanese restaurants in this part of the city, you almost forget you're in the tropics and it feels like you're somewhere in the shadow of Mount Fuji, in the land of the rising sun. Everything here is made with the classic Japanese delicacy, only the bare minimum of seasoning necessary to supplement the perfect bites of chicken served in a dozen different ways. But of course, that's not why we're here. We're here because this is one of the only places in Bangkok that serves the old school pre-1914 dorayaki, a single pancake wrapped around a filling, in this case cream and satsumaimo, or Japanese sweet potato. It's surprising and complex, so good that it starts to make sense not just why Thai cooks would have adapted the recipe, but why there are so many legends and stories about the origin of the dish itself. This is a story that's gone in a lot of directions. But to put the pieces together, in the 1600s the Portuguese introduced the technique of making cakes to both Ayutthaya and Japan. The Japanese developed a dish called dorayaki, which would in 1964 be introduced to Thailand through the opening of a department store, which because of timing and branding and being a product with mass appeal would become an iconic Thai snack. In other words, this simple hot dog in a pancake isn't that simple at all. It's a wild story and one that's still evolving today, with Thailand taking its version in new and creative directions and the Japanese dessert finding its own national resurgence, not least because of its association with the famous anime character Doraemon, who is, like so many, obsessed with dorayaki. Through this one dish, we can trace the path of Thailand's progress, the evolution of modern Japan and hundreds of years of political and culinary history. And so, on our way home, the only thing left to do is stop for one last Kanam Tokyo. This time, at least, with some more appreciation of how much more it actually is than a hot dog in a pancake. Maybe I should take my words back from the beginning of this video. It still might not be my favorite thing, but it is definitely worth a stop on a trip to the kingdom. Subscribe to the channel for more from OTR. Thank you so much to everyone who supports us on Patreon. It helps to keep us going. Find the links below for our Patreon and social media, and we'll see you next time.